And otherwise, we'll get started with our afternoon program. So this afternoon, uh, we have a plenary speaker and then another six presentations, and our theme for the afternoon is Navigating Change. So I'm very happy to introduce to you our plenary speaker for this afternoon's session, when I find his blurb. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, Bruce, I'm getting your information. Here we go. So our afternoon plenary speaker is Dr Bruce Taylor. Bruce is the GBR coordinator at the Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organisation. Bruce is a human geographer who studies how environmental policies are developed and implemented and how the involvement of private, public and civil society interests influence policy and program outcomes. He co-leads the Stakeholder and Traditional Owner Engagement sub-program of the Reef Restoration and Adaptation Program and his role is coordinating Great Barrier Reef research, supporting collaboration within SORO and with impact partners in government, reef managers, research and development, industry and investors. So have we got you online, Bruce? Yes, you do, Michelle. Have you got me? Excellent. So I'll hand over Great. to you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Michelle. Um, an afternoon, everyone. I'll just see if I can coordinate my screen sharing here. How's that going? Have people got those slides up? No, we don't have the slides, Bruce. We can't see you either. Oh, sorry. Oh, here we go. <laughs> How's that? Is that good now? Yes. Fantastic. Okay, um, well, good day and um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I really wish I could have been there today, but with COVID, unfortunately, I'm, I'm grounded in Brisbane. Um, look, I'd like to start by acknowledging the Walgarukaba peoples and Bindal peoples of the Townsville region and all the Great Barrier Reef traditional owners and pay my respects to um, the elders past, present and emerging. Um, as Michelle indicated, this afternoon's session is about navigating change. Uh, and in this talk, I'd like to explore this theme through a discussion about the reef restoration and adaptation program. Um, as one of several important initiatives that are underway at the moment in the Great Barrier Reef. Um, my aim is to give you a bit of a brief overview of the role of social science activities in that program and particularly around uh, some of the opportunities and challenges that we're um, engaging with around participation. Um, you'll see also from most of the slides that I've talked through today that um, there's a number of partners involved in the RAP. Um, and it is very much a strong partnership between the Australian government, the Great Barrier Reef Foundation, um, and several uh, national government-based and um, academic research organisations. So I'd like to also acknowledge my co-leads um, in the first part of this work, um, being Stuart Lockie, Karen Bella and Brent Ritchie, but also there's up to 20 social scientists currently involved in this work, and a number of them are in the room with you today. So people like um, Samantha, who spoke earlier, Matt Kernock, Aaron Behensky, Mark Lim, Max Newlands, um, they're also good go-to people if you want to follow up on any of this today. So I'd like to start by, um, I guess, pointing out that since 2017, there's been a very deliberate and explicit conversation happening in the Great Barrier Reef around a shift in the management paradigm. Um, now, that, that shift involves expanding, expanding the focus from what has been maybe tradi traditional um, setting, setting up management arrangements and monitoring their effectiveness and focusing on protecting and conserving the reef and its values to a posture which is much more um, geared towards active anticipatory and even interventionist modes of working. Um, what this means is that, um, or what it certainly implies, is that there's um, much greater appetite for risk taking in the way in which the reef is managed because of the threats and pressures which it's facing. But importantly, that this action needs to be taken collaboratively and with a focus on uh, joint learning. And within that, there's a, 
a real significant role for the research and development sector. And as part of that, um, both the blueprint and subsequent policies the Marine Park Authority have developed have pointed to the role of the research and development sector in developing science and, and engineering based um, actions that can help um, the reef to restore and to adapt to its changing circumstances. So the program that I wanted to speak to today is the Reef Restoration and Adaptation Program. Um, and as I said, that's um, a program that's focused on developing a set of engineering and technology based responses to support large scale restoration and adaptation in the reef. Um, the three overarching objectives of the RRAP, if you can see in that little diagram on the right hand side, if that's visible, is firstly to prevent exposure of the reef to temperature extremes. Now, um, from a technology point of view, that's focusing on interventions like developing marine cloud brightening as part of um, a cooling and shading response. Um, the second goal there around assisting adaptation to climate change is being pursued through um, techniques such as selective breeding for heat tolerant corals, for example. Um, and the third one there around restoring and promoting recovery of priority reefs there's a range of approaches there, but they include things like rubble stabilisation after storm events um, and also um, supporting the resettlement of, of coral larvae um, to help reef recovery in, in strategic locations. So the RAP has had, um, we're, we're, in, we're in the second of three potential phases. Between 2018 and 2019, there was a concept feasibility phase, which was a bit of a sprint to work out whether certain technologies were doable, whether they were affordable, and if we could do them and afford them, would they actually make a difference in the context of the reef's reef wellbeing? Um, we're currently in the second phase of the work, which is termed the research and development phase. Now in that phase, we're really focusing on taking those, um, taking those interventions that we think are gonna have some merit and uh, field testing and trialling those interventions and engaging really heavily around um, public stakeholder and traditional owner involvement and um, looking at issues like you know, regulatory, uh, regulatory concerns around making sure those technologies are kind of permitted uh, appropriately. The third phase of the work um, at the end of the current three to four year cycle, um, should it go well, is to think about how those small to medium sized field trials can be sc scaled up to regional levels or reef wide levels so that they can actually um, work. So what I want to touch on now are some uh, a really high level overview of in some insights um, that the social science component of that fe early feasibility phase um, landed on back in 2018, 2019. Um, there are a number of methods that that team uh, employed and the focus of that work was really to start to get our head around. If we were to go ahead with this work, what would the public think? What do stakeholders think and what are their needs? And what sort of roles and needs and aspirations do key rights holders like traditional owners have in, regarding their involvement in the program going forward? So we... Um, used a number of ways to kind of explore those questions. The first of those was to undertake a, a national survey of reef residents and the Australian public, and we uh, surveyed 3,100 individuals. Um, what we found from that bit of work was um, focusing on this idea that uh, the types of interventions that I described earlier, um, generally speaking, there was what I would classify as cautious acceptance by survey respondents of those technologies. That is, um, most the, the overwhelming majority of responses sat between, um, you know, uh, undecided to quite positive um, attitudes towards some of these technologies. And of course, that has to be qualified by saying that the level of knowledge about those technologies is low and that it was before anything had actually happened. And so you need to sort of put that response in, in those terms. Secondly, the survey pointed out that 
public trust in the science community and reef managers was high. Um, and it was high in relation to being able to um, progress an agenda around restoration and adaptation for the reef. But it was also conditional. So the conditions there that came through the survey responses was that communities were consulted and that, and not just consulted, but were kind of involved and that um, the regulatory systems that were in place were up to scratch to make sure that the risks were manageable. The team also undertook 24 uh, in-depth interviews and undertook some consultation across a range of reef advisory fora, which are in place at the moment. Um, those interviews, as you start getting down lower to where the rubber hits the road and the people whose livelihoods are impacted or likely to be impacted by these sorts of changes, um, the, the response had started to vary. So what we heard there was that people generally recognised the need for action, but there were also some very real questions that people had about whether or not what was being proposed would work and also what some of the motives were behind um, members of the science community and also members of the government and of the government who are investing in this work. Similarly, there were some concerns raised about potential future consequences, both of acting and importantly of not acting. So people really struggled with this idea um, of, you know, should we, shouldn't we, and could see the kind of pros and cons of, of the two ways of moving forward. The sort of concerns that were raised were around irreversibility of, or the potential irreversibility of some of the actions, um, changes to the ecology, changes to safety, like in the marine environment and access to those locations where, where technologies were being trialled and deployed, and obviously a, a range of uh, questions and concerns around aesthetic changes to the reef, impacts on culture and on community wellbeing that might flow from that. Perhaps the strongest message that came through during that feasibility phase is that people felt that the key requirement to managing risk and identifying opportunities for benefit sharing was through involvement. So involvement was absolutely fundamental and that um, it, particularly partnering with traditional owners around the questions of co-benefits and the management of biocultural risks was really paramount. Um, the, uh, one of the other bits of work we did there as well was reviewing the existing engagement processes and forums in the reef, and there was over 120 of those that we identified. Um, and while those processes and forums meet a range of needs, um, we didn't feel that there was anything that was that was particularly well suited to the needs of the of the RAP program. And so we're all, we're starting to look at uh, establishing some processes that will support that. So stepping back briefly and looking at some of the um, ideas that are helpful in this context, when faced with the sort of responses we got through that feasibility phase, um, we felt that a risk governance perspective was probably really useful in helping us design our, our participation strategy. Um, and without going too deeply into it at this moment, and I know there's a number of talks on governance later which, which may address this, but what the risk governance perspective offers us is saying, the messier the problem gets, the more you need to engage people in deep, meaningful deliberation and power sharing. So rather than the messier it gets, leave it to the experts, it's actually the opposite. The messier it gets, it's all hands on deck. And so that's really, that kind of thinking has really shaped the way in which we've approached um, the engagement strategy for the R&D phase. In terms of the current R&D phase, um, our overarching aim is to support the development of interventions that are social, socially and culturally responsible and that are seen to be legitimate and acceptable to traditional owners, stakeholders, managers and the public. And there's three sub-goals here. One is around making sure we're doing due diligence and, and monitoring um, perceptions and gathering data around um, what people think about the program, the interventions and the impacts on the reef over time, and also thinking through the distribution of risks and benefits arising from the program and future deployment, as well as identifying co-benefits that might be achieved. The second one is around uh, designing and piloting and implementing some novel or best practice engagement approaches. And the third is around involving people in the evaluation and adaptive management of the program. 
So as a really rough overview of the types of activities which are within that engagement sub-program that we're currently in and setting up at the moment, um, the first component, if you look at those three white bubbles in the middle, the one on the top left being led out of JCU by Stuart Lockie is um, around social licence and monitoring, and that involves um, maintaining a regular survey of Great Barrier Reef residents, um, undertaking a rolling set of deep dive, um, in-depth qualitative interviews, I think around 70 of those interviews every year for the life of the program, and also um, developing a social, cultural and economic impact assessment to, to start to interface with the formal decision-making processes of, of the program. On the right-hand side, we've got a suite of activities um, that nominally CSIRO are leading, but these are very much an integrated set of activities across the partners around best practice engagement and involves citizen science uh, and thinking about what role citizen science can play, particularly in relation to demonstration sites for some of these technologies, um, around thinking through what sort of new businesses, jobs um, or uh, reef-related enterprises might be developed through, through the program itself or through um, deployment of the technologies at a later date. Um, we're also um, touching on Oh, sorry, what Claudia touched on around um, deliberation and setting up some uh, deliberative panels to look at specific technologies like marine cloud brightening and in the process of um, finalising some terms of reference for those panels at the moment. And we're also in discussions with the traditional owner technical working group um, for the Reef Trust partnership around how we might progress a collaborative project for um, assessing biocultural risks associated with some of these interventions. The third component of the program looking ahead, um, being led from QUT with Karen Vella and her team, um, involves setting up a high level stakeholder reference group to be part of the governance arrangements of the program, uh, supporting a monitoring and evaluation strategy, and also supporting um, cross, cross collaboration between programs within the within the RAP, which is quite a complex, complex initiative. It's also worth pointing out that we're starting to support and partner on a range of um, place-based approaches. And, and the first one um, that we've been involved in is the Cairnsport Douglas Restoration Hub, which is about providing a forum for two-way knowledge sharing between uh, local restoration um, actors and the large scale stuff that's happening under the RAP. So I'm conscious I'm, I'm racing through this and it's a lot of work, but um, in terms of trying to summarise some of the challenges that the team's engaging in at the moment, um, the first of those challenges uh, are around trying to ensure that there is open dialogue both within the program and between the program and the wider public, and that we've been realistic about the expectations of what the program can and can't do. Um, in the first instance, it's really important to state that this isn't about a quick technical fix. This is um, acknowledging that restoration is never going to be enough in its own right, and that without mitigation, none of the restoration or adaptation interventions will actually have enough um, go in them to get over the line. So mitigation of CO2 is absolutely fundamental. Um, the second point to make is that the Reef Restoration Adaptation Program is very much about supporting resilience in the system to help it adapt and recover um, when the opportunity presents itself, not about rebuilding the entire reef. And the third point is, is that we're very much likely to be um, working in a space over the next decade and more where we've got new or fundamentally changed ecosystems. And with that comes a whole range of questions about uh, changed or new ecosystem services and values, and also exploring what the implications are for livelihoods and for culture. The second major set of challenges that we're dealing with um, inside and outside the program is around the interface of the social science work, which has been done with the formal decision making. And um, as you'd appreciate, the type of approaches that we're developing are very much involved participatory and deliberative methods, the gathering of social data and evidence and 
thinking through how that works its way into the more formal technical risk assessment processes of, of the RAP and also um, works in concert with decision making that's happening within the authority and other levels of government. The other major challenge associated with that is how do we genuinely support two-way knowledge sharing and with that the power sharing that that implies and that's a real kind of live and ongoing conversation within within the program at the moment. And the last set of challenges um, revolve around um, what I like to think of as balancing the different goals of participation. Now, the first of those is sort of instrumental. So in a way, from an engineering and technical point of view, this is about kind of getting it right, making it work. Um, the normative concerns are about um, why we're doing it and should we be doing it? And the procedural goals are around how we should go about it and how we're doing it the right way. So balancing those sort of three different perspectives up is really critical at the moment. Um, one of the challenges that we have, and again, this is an area of ongoing conversation, is about managing expectations um, that social science is there to deliver social licence for the program. And, and that's a bit of a kind of, you know, group learning exercise in the program where we're very much trying to um, come from the point of view is that what we're doing is helping the program exercise, as part of the program, we're helping it exercise its responsibility for social licence rather than guaranteeing it. Um, the second issue is about timeframes and the nature of relationships over time. Um, there's obviously a bunch of really short term needs. So the scientists are doing field trials. Um, there's a whole bunch of engagement that needs to happen around approvals for those field trials um, versus setting up the foundations for much longer term partnerships. So when we reach the deployment phase, thanks Umberto, um, when we reach the deployment phase, we've actually got some really meaningful partnerships in place with traditional owners and industries to make this stuff work in the longer term. Um, so I'll wrap up there, but I'll just conclude by saying um, at the start of my talk, I um, raised the prospect that we're entering a new, a new uh, management paradigm in the reef and that this necessitates more inclusive and collaborative approaches to risk taking. Um, what I've tried to do today is give you a sense of how we're embarking on that through the RAP and the contribution that social science is making and is hoping to make in navigating that challenge. So thanks very much. Thanks. Thanks so much, Bruce, for that talk. It's Michelle here. Um, the question that I had for you is this concept of social licence. I wonder how, how are you deciding that you do or don't have social licence, given we've heard a lot today about how views are becoming increasingly polarised? Well, yeah, I mean, that's... Oh, I'm going to feed back there. Um, that's, that's a really important question, Michelle, and I think the way that the team is approaching it is not just to focus on social licence. Um, we're trying to take a much broader perspective, um, and that broader perspective involves questions like, um, uh, you know, is it, uh, are, we, are we designing and approaching participation processes in, a, in an accessible and a just and meaningful way? Um, are we giving people the opportunity to really influence how the program evolves and that their concerns and risks are being taken seriously. And I think social licence in that way then becomes um, one of a number of possible outcomes of those conversations rather than a, um, an, an objective that is being sought directly. Um, so, yeah, I guess, you know, it's as much about the how we work through that than, than what the ultimate aim is.